All right, there we go. So welcome for those people watching this offline. I'm going to get and start the session here. Um, so kind of like I was saying, you know, these aren't going to be regular classes or lectures. These are really supposed to be help sessions. I am, I, I, I'm probably going to talk more about the assignment one. I started talking about that on Tuesday. But, you know, feel free at any time to interrupt, you know, with questions if you want to clarify stuff. Hopefully everybody has their dev box up at this point um, and is able to work on the assignments. Uh, if not, you're a bit late, but um, um, we can still look at that here. Uh, the first assignment is due today. So um, let me check uh, my online person. Could you give me a check again that the audio is okay? Um, if you could. All right, thank you. Great. Um, so I'll just start talking about the assignment. I, I did um, talk a little bit about it on Tuesday. I'm, I'm going to cover. I'm going to go over that again. I'm, I'm not certain why, because I actually had um, started you guys on the first task last time. Uh, I don't know what happened to my work from last time, but that's fine. So we can we can do that again anyway. So um, let me just remind you, kind of in general, uh, the, the other thing I want to talk about. Uh, you know, um, I'm going to leave some time for this because uh, I want to give you a kind of more of a big picture sort of thing. So really, we, we've got five assignments for this uh, five week um, compressed summer session. Each one is really a simulation of an aspect of an operating system. All this, this first one is really more of a simulation of a, of a, of, of a hypothetical machine, more, more of a computer architecture sort of thing. But uh, but yeah, I mean, next week we're going to be simulating um, um, uh, a process manager. So so our, our units next week uh, where we do chapter three and four are about processes and threads. So we'll look at um, uh, implementing a process data structure and managing it through the basic life cycle of dispatching it, timing out. Um, and our third simulation, uh, our third unit is on um, concurrency. So we will implement um, a banker's algorithm, I believe is the one that I picked uh, for the summer here. Uh, anyway, something that's a, a particular algorithm for deadlock detection that we'll talk about in the third unit. Uh, our fourth one is on a memory manager, which is an important piece. So four and five are memory managers, and um, then uh, actually a page replacement manager. Uh, and then five is on a job scheduler, which are kind of two big components of operating systems. So, so anyway, I mean, you know, that's kind of the the purpose of these simulations um, is um, to actually code parts of some of the stuff you're supposed to be learning about. Uh, with the readings uh, and the lecture videos and things like that. So, so yeah, for this first one, back to this first one, I covered this a little bit, but uh, we are actually implementing the hypothetical machine architecture that you did for the first problem set um, and that's described in our textbook in chapter one. So, um, so it's described in here, but um, we've got, I guess I didn't have an example, but but we've got files. I showed this these last time. Um, so all of the simulations kind of work like this. There'll be, a, we use a file for input. So, so I did show this last time. So for example, for this first simulator, uh, the input files look like this. So this is the input to specify a complete simulation of one of these hypothetical machines. So this is the initial value of the registers, you know, and this is actually should be the same. Um, if I didn't mention this last time, this should be the same um as the example of the hypothetical machine um uh, from our stallings textbook in chapter one so you know they, they had an example of uh, chapter one here um oh um did i not i probably didn't share my desktop sorry about that for the online people um again feel free to you know um <laughs> um um let me know if, if there's an issue, but yeah, I meant to share my desktop as well here. So, there you go. So that should be a little bit better for my uh, online person. They can see what I'm kind of doing here on the desktop. Um, anyway, so this hypothetical machine is described um, uh, here. Um, and you know, there's an example, you had to do this for your first problem set, right? Um, so, um, 
But you know, it, it's a very simple kind of thing. But this is the way all computer, this is the way all hardware works, CPU works. Um, um, so you know, there's a basic fetch execute cycle, and and at this level, the computer is really dumb. I mean, all it's doing is doing this over and over. You know, so the program counter typically you have something corresponding to a program counter, uh, whatever the program counter. Uh, is pointing to in memory, it fetches that address uh, into the CPU from um, primary memory, from RAM, right? Uh, that's the fetch stage. The fetch stage is relatively simple compared to the execute stage. And then the execute stage is whatever the, the, the instruction that was that was fetched gets executed. And that's more complex because there are multiple instructions. So uh, that part of the hardware of the, the CPU chip, uh, you know, has to have different things for each type of, of operation that's um, supported. So, you know, you've got your basic data processing um, instructions, you know, this is all kind of reviewed in chapter one here, you know, so adds and subtracts, you know, arithmetic operations, logical operations, uh, you got other categories of operations. So you've got load and store. So, so you need to be able to load data from memory um, and store it back, get it in and out of the CPU. Um, and you've got your things, oh, the flow control instructions. So that's something that they didn't show in this example here, but I added those into your problem set. So like a jump, conditional jumps or unconditional jumps are examples of those. So that, that allows you to actually change the program counter. So that's how you actually implement things like loops and if statements, conditional statements in a higher level programming language. Uh, they get they get compiled into jumps in order to implement like a loop or something uh, like a machine uh instruction level machine architecture level um anyway so back to this so this is the the, the first simulation file that we have is exactly the same one as this one so you know the program counter starts at 300 uh this was the contents of memory the accumulator um wasn't shown here but it was but basically because a load was done so it didn't matter what was in the accumulator it got overwritten at the, ver at the very first execute here um and this was the contents of memory so we just knew that we had these instructions and data at various memory locations. So that, that's the same thing that we're doing uh, in code here. You know? So we've got the initial values of the program counter and the accumulator, which are the only instructions that we use here. Um, and um, um, we've got the um, contents of memory. So you know, we don't show all of memory. Um, so in, in our implementation of a simulator here, Anything that's not specified um, is assumed to have a zero value in it. it. Should be initialized with zero. We use that as like a no op code for this um, for our simulation for this first assignment. But yeah, so anyway, so we you know we've got these data. Actually, these are get interpreted as instructions at memory address 300, 301, 302. Um, and these are actually used as data. So we have signed integers um, defined in our hypothetical machine. Uh, uh, format here. So anything that's um, treated as a signed integer, we use the, the most significant bit as a signed bit, um, and the other 15 bits in this case as a magnitude, you know, the, the, the value of the integer. So, um, anyway, so I, you know, I want people kind of to be clear about that. So it, it helps in doing the assignments uh if, if you kind of understand the big picture you know kind of what we're doing uh on these things so uh so in this case you know so, so uh, for all these assignments a lot of the things are kind of given for you i mean some of the things but you have to basically implement uh some of the key pieces of the simulations uh in order to, to get them working so uh like in this one um you know for example, there's already an implementation of the load program, so that's actually used when we run the simulation. I'm going to show you how, to, how you can actually run these by hand in your dev box here. But that's actually used to give the name of a file, to load that in, um, and to set up all of the uh, member variables, to set up the memory array, um, the memory base address, memory bounds address, and things like that um, in order to perform a simulation, right? So. Um, Anyway, you know, as I showed on Tuesday, then I can go back. I'll re-talk about some of these, and then maybe go a little bit more detail then of some of the other tasks. So, in, in in kind of at the low level, what it comes down to is you all have to. There's a set of tasks. I call it what unit test tasks. 
uh, and you have to implement these. You have to complete these tasks with assignments. Right? Um, you should implement these in order. Often tasks afterwards assume that your code is working on the previous one. So you shouldn't try and skip any of these. You shouldn't go to, you shouldn't start working on uh, task two until you've got all task one completed and all of its uh, tests uh, in the unit tests are passing. So, um, so actually initialized memory, like I discussed, um, is used as a hook by the load uh, program. So it calls, whenever it comes to um, this instruction, when it's loading the file, it's gonna call initialized memory, passing it the, the first value as the base address and the second value as the uh, bounds address or the end address, right? So that, that's that's where the initialized memory, the first task kind of fits in um, on your assignment. So I'm, I'm repeating here, but I showed this last time. So there's actually, you know, it, we, we actually already declared, if, if you're not so familiar with using uh, multi-file projects, like a C++ project like this, we, we put all the declarations, this is standard for C and C++ programs. So, all the declarations of things of classes and member variables and member functions of the classes are going to be in a header file for our simulation and usually we'll have one class one main class there'll be some others uh, as, when, we, when we get to the uh, later assignments in this class but to be one class that that does the simulation that we're doing for that unit right um but anyway all the declarations are in here including for example the declaration for initialized memory so initialized memory takes just two input parameters, the base address and the bounds address, um, and doesn't return anything. So it's a void function. Right? Um, so, you know, um, and really all this initialized memory is doing this first task, you know, this is supposed to be a little bit of a warm up. It does a little bit more um, than this, but, uh, you know, the first thing you just need to do is initialize some of these member variables. So there's a memory member variable called memory base address and memory bounds address and memory size that all need to be initialized by initialized memory, right? So that's a relatively easy task. So hopefully everybody can get that far and get that working, right? So it kind of as an aside, I mean, I know a lot of this sometimes is, um, um, you know, people haven't worked on, I mean, this isn't that big. These, these simulations aren't that big, but but bigger maybe than some uh, people are used to on assignments for classes, even for graduate classes. Uh, but um, we are using a lot of pretty standard um, uh, things in the industry now. So, for example, these are all um, these assignments are all set up so that you use uh, what are known as tests or unit tests. Uh, that should be how you do your your workflow. Okay, so um, when you start an assignment here, you should make certain that everything's building. Um, so, I talked about this a little bit on Tuesday. Um, um, there, there are, if you're using the key, the, the dev box and you've um, got everything set up correctly, there are some keyboard shortcuts um, associated with the basic workflow that you're going to do. So control shift one will clean your project so you can get a clean bill in case you're having some mysterious link errors, you might want to do a clean. But normally what you want to do is do a control shift two to rebuild anything that's out of date. So, so the build system will... Um, figure out any files that need to be recompiled and it will recompile them um, and then it will link them together. So, um, you know, I don't remember if I talked about um, this too much last time or not. So, I mean, just to throw a few things out here while I'm looking at it, you, you ought to, you know, if you haven't worked with compiled languages a lot, you ought to make a little bit of an effort to understand what's happening here whenever you do a build. So notice, I mean, basically we're just, you know, when you're doing a build, we're using the uh, the, the GNU C++ compiler in this case, uh, but you can see what it's doing here um, from the output in the terminal here. So basically the, the, the these first ones is basically, it's it's compiling a file called assignment1test.cpp and it, it um, um, th this is known as um, incremental compilation. So it, 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 uh, since it's a multi-file project, you compile files separately into an intermediate format. So this dot O are known as object files, right? Um, so that's kind of an intermediate format. So, so first we compile this file into an object file. Then we compile this file into an object file, hypothetical machine simulator. Uh, and then here you can also use the G++ compiler to actually link things as well. So this is slightly different than the first two. So here we're actually linking together uh, the two object files we compiled plus this object file, which has something for the test 
the unit test framework that we're using um, and another one. So we're actually linking together four object files into the resulting executable. So the, the this test executable um, is what is actually run when you run the unit tests, okay? Um, and I, I, I think I showed this on Tuesday. You, you can do all the stuff from the command line. And so these, the Visual Studio Code is a, is a, is a powerful IDE. Um, so it does allow you to do things from the GUI, but most all of the stuff when you do things actually hook down into command line tools um, 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 like this. So um, in this case, you know, we're using the, the build system, so you can do all the stuff by hand, do like a make to rebuild everything. Notice that make or make all, um, um, if everything's up to date, it doesn't have to recompile or relink anything, right? So it, it, it can determine if a file needs to be recompiled by looking at the dates. That's part of what a build system does. Um, you can run the tests, you know, um, by, by doing make tests here. Um, and um, but uh, where was I going? Oh, oh yes, so I remember. Um, so uh, kind of back to this, just to finish up my thought on this. Um, so you know, here we're building these. We're actually building two executables. There's the test executable and the sim executable. Uh, I want to talk about the sim executable. That I mean, that's the, the actual actual purpose of these assignments is to get this sim the, the simulation so that you can actually run simulations of the hypothetical machine or the memory manager or whatever uh, we're implementing but you can also run those executables by hand so um both the the test executable and the sim executable are just output to the current directory so if you want to so you do a directory listing uh, th this is a standard uh, ubuntu linux um, um, that are dev box that you're running in your dev box here. So, so if you open up a terminal, you're actually using uh, a Linux or Unix command line commands to do things, right? So LS does a directory listing. Um, if you want to run the executable like test or sim or the run system test here, so these green ones are all actually things that are executable. So I can do a, 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 a longer listing to, to look at the permissions. So, but in particular, the, the green means that the execute bit is set for these, which when you compile these, uh, that's one thing the compiler does. Is it compiles, creates the file, and it sets them to be executable. So you can run them just like other commands on the command line. So in this case, if I want to run my test, I can do dot slash test. If I want to run the sim, dot, dot slash sim to run those. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, um, but um, you can also run, there, there's a keyboard shortcut um, associated with run the test. So the normal thing you'll do is do control shift two to rebuild after you try and implement a bit, something, one of the tasks, and then you'll do control shift three to run the test, okay? So, um, small, I can, can't grab that. So normally what you should do whenever you run the unit tests, uh, you should scroll all the way back up to the top and find the first test that's failing. So your normal workflow is you always want to concentrate on the first failing test and figure out why that's failing, what's happening there, all right? So our first one that's failing, and, and here, um, I don't know, I haven't looked around enough. There, there's probably some other kind of uh, unit test frameworks that would uh, hook better into Visual Studio Code, so you could actually click on these and go to the test that's failing. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have that. So you do have to use kind of the line numbers for this. So in this case, you have to kind of look, find your first failing test and see that it's the test at line 31 here in the uh, unit test file. That's the one that's failing. So, so if we go to the assignment one tests, find our line 31, it's, it's that one. Right? But then, you know, if you figure that out, I mean, you know, the basic thing that these are telling you is that we called initialized memory, and then after initialized memory, we're expecting that if we call the get memory base address uh, member function, it should return 300 because the base address should have been initialized to 300. But uh, right now, you know, it's returning zero. So the thing on the left is what was returned by calling get memory get memory base address. 
And the thing on the right was what was expected here in our test or our assertion here. Right? Um, yeah, and likewise, so 32, all of them are failing. 32 is failing because we expect 1,000 to be returned by get memory of house address and, and 700. The, the size of the memory is 700. There's, there's 700 addresses from 300 to 1,000, um, um, basically. The difference with those two is what we consider the, the, the size of memory that we need to simulate here. Um, all so, you know, the, your normal workflow, you know, I, I encourage you to learn how to do kind of incremental development. So, you know, it's, it's felt those are relatively simple to get those tests to pass. If we actually implement uh, initialized memory, um, so we do things like uh, initialize the memory base address member variable. Okay. So I, I mentioned this last time. This is pretty, you'll, you'll see this in a lot of C code. So uh, we named the parameter for this um, member function, memory base address. It has the same name as the, um, the private member variable, right? So there's actually some ambiguity, right? So if you know how um, object oriented programming languages like C work, this inside of this member function, we can access member variables of the hypothetical machine simulator class, um, even though they're private, because this is a member function of the hypothetical machine simulator. So we can set it, initialize it, but there's ambiguity. So there's both a, a member variable called memory base address, and there's a parameter called memory base address. So those two things with kind of the same name. So in C++, in other languages, you have to do other things maybe to disambiguate, or you might not be allowed to use a parameter name that's the same as the member variable name. Uh, but here uh, in C++, we can disambiguate by using the this keyword. So this, uh, by, by having this here, the compiler knows that you mean the member variable on the left side, left hand side. So we want to assign the parameter that's passed in, whatever value it is, to the private member variable by doing this assignment. Um, so anyway, like, like I was saying about incremental development, I encourage you to, you know, only put in a line or two of code and then all you should be doing a lot of compiling and running the test, right? So, you know, if, if you make a mistake, you more quickly realize it uh, when you get a um, compiler error um, and, and you can go back and, and will be more likely to be able to um, uh, understand what problem you introduced for compilation or whatever, or, or logic error. Oops. So if you have your IntelliSense working, you should have things, you know, like, uh, you know, it detects problems like that on the fly, uh, it allows for completion of uh, variable names, things like that. It looks up um, documentation for things. So anyway. Let's see here. Although sometimes the IntelliSense updates, I don't know why that squiggle is there. Uh, I think it's probably just, uh, let's try it. So let's compile. Yeah, everything seems to be compiling and then we'll run control shift three. Oh, uh, another thing I think I mentioned, but um, the keyboard shortcuts only work if you have focus in the editor. So sometimes when you compile, the focus changes down to your terminal and then you'll be wondering, you know, why isn't why can't I compile or run my tests? So you do have to get the focus back to the editor for these keyboard shortcuts that we're using. Um, need to make that bigger, it's hard to grab. Um, so at, at this point, you know, kind of back to it, um, we should see that uh, I made some progress, right? Um, the test at 31 is passing as, as we expect here because we're initializing the base address, but my first failing test is now 32. So, um, I think last time I did show, you know, of course we can get those other two. Um, get those other two tests to pass here. So uh, what's it called? Um, um, memory size, that's what I meant. Yep. 
Um, so we get the other, the next two tests to pass by initializing the member bounds address. Um, and, you know, so we don't have the size as a parameter, but the size is an inferred property from the difference between the last and the first um, address of memory that we're going to simulate here. Right? So that should get us some more progress then, but, but, you know, so I'm, I'm just showing this kind of, again, just uh, that this should be your general workflow for these assignments. You know, you, you go in, implement a little bit, see how you're doing then on, on your tests. You know? So now we're actually um, passing a lot of these. Um, you know, so after we initialize, men, so it work, it's working for these as well. If we initialize the base and the balance to 42 and 917, um, um, we're passing those, but we're actually failing. The first one we're failing now is down to um, um, throwing this exception. And maybe I'll, I'll go ahead and show that. I think I talked about that. I didn't actually show fixing that one. So, uh, but there is one thing that's kind of missing that uh, I really I need to go back to this assignment and fix this because I'm not really testing. You, there is another thing you're supposed to do on the initialized memory. You need to allocate uh, the uh, array that's going to be used to simulate the memory, right? It, that, that's described in the assignment, but if you don't do that, uh, it won't hurt anything until later on. Um, you'll find out that you're having problems if you're not allocating the memory. So um, so I'm, I'm probably going to go ahead and just pretty much like give most all of the, assignment of the first task here. So it, it, this is described in here, okay? But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. If you're not familiar or haven't done a lot of stuff with dynamic memory allocation, all we're doing is using the new to dynamically allocate a block of memory. And in, in C and C++, actually this is a C++ thing here. So in C++, new and delete are the keywords that we use for dynamic memory allocation. Um, effectively, this returns an array, okay? So, so, so if you look at the code, it returns a, a pointer to an integer. Um, so if we look at, um, if you look at the declaration of the mem memory um, uh, private member variable, it's declared as an integer pointer, but that's the way new works. So if you do new, it asks for a block of memory, it returns a pointer to the base uh, of that block of memory. But afterwards, you can just treat memory like you would a regular C array after you dynamically allocate it. Okay, so that, that's all that's happening here if you're not familiar with dynamic memory allocation. So, you know, Feel free to jump in if you have questions. So, so you know, you just uh, so this is another thing that you need to do. I think you should probably just copy and paste that. Copy that. Um, so that will actually allocate it. And you're also supposed to, you need to initialize this memory to be all zero here, right? Oh, so notice that, uh, you know, we are, um, allocate, depending on, you know, the base and the bounds address, we're just allocating exactly enough memory, an array that's exactly big enough to, to hold all the addresses that were specified um, in the, uh, you know, in the simulation from the base and the bounds address, right? So, um, so, um, I leave a little bit out here. I mean, you do have to have like a loop or something to initialize all this memory to zero. But, you know, as I was started saying, I mean, after you dynamically allocate an array, you can treat this memory, um, 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 uh, you know, prep member variable like, uh, like any other C or C++ array. So if I wanted to initialize the value to index zero to be zero, I can do that, right? Um, oh, um, yeah, so I'll just mention that. So, yeah, these, in theory, these the simulators can be used to run multiple simulations uh, without restarting uh, a new executable. So, Part of this is is uh, you're supposed to detect. Um, I mean, I don't think actually it hurts anything if you miss this step. But what this is talking about here, uh, there's an example of this probably um, in the constructors here. Let me just bring up 
the constructor or maybe the reset kind of a hint. I, I, I really like using the outline for IDEs like this. If they don't have that feature, then I don't really like the ID. So in particular, right, instead of searching or scrolling around, just bring this up. So I'm going to go to the reset function. So we're talking about something like this, the same as what reset does here is basically the same that if, if some memory has been dynamically allocated, um, so if, if the memory member variable um, is not null, that means that we've dynamically allocated some memory, so we want to free that up if we're going to reset and restart a simulation here. Um, I think you should do that in the initialized memory as well, or at least that's what the uh, um, that's what the meta comments. So that's what it was talking about here. If the memory is already allocated, so. Oops. Why am I paste working? That's weird. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, I don't know. Okay, anyway, there we are. So, um, something like that. So, basically, all this does, if you do that before you al allocate the memory, if there's something already allocated, when we call initialize memory, it will free it up. So, this, this is being a good. Um, memory manager, you know, using the dynamic memory allocation correctly. You know. uh, after that, we're, we're sure that um, that there's no memory allocated, so we can allocate a new block. So then, then we need to initialize it. Um, and then as a final thing, let me just go ahead and give, because you will have to, for a lot of these assignments, you will have to throw exceptions when needed. So we have a little bit of de defensive programming, defensive execution in some of these simulations. So um, in particular, I didn't realize that was commented out like that. Uh, let's find an example of throwing an exception here. There's a good example. So, um, So for all these um, um, assignment simulations, there's a class created for you that gets linked in called simulator exception. That's what you need to throw whenever you're asked to for any of these tasks here. Um, and you can, you can it, it expects a string uh, for the message that's given when you throw the exception. So, uh, so for our initialized memory, Uh, you, you probably should do this beforehand because basically, basically, um, if you look at the tests, um, again, I, I probably should add some more tests in here. But if 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 memory was um, It's invalid to have a memory address bigger than a thousand. Actually, probably it should be nine ninety nine, but I said a thousand here. So the only thing that's being tested here is, is um, um, if you have a value bigger than a thousand as the bounds address, right? And and that kind of goes back to you know, um, since we're using sixteen bits, um, all of our memory addresses uh, use um, uh, twelve bits, uh, so they only have three digits. Basically, so there's a, a effective um, limit from zero to nine 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 hexadecimal um, for memory addresses here. So, anyway, that's kind of why where that's coming from. Although um, you don't have to worry about hexadecimal to decimal conversion for the simulation, like you did for the problem set, because we're really just treating things as decimal numbers in the simulation. Um, we're not we're not worrying that the data is represented as a hexadecimal value. So. Um, so we kind of skipped over that. So, um, anyway. So for that one thing that's being tested, um, you could do something like,
you know, test that the memory bound address isn't something that doesn't make sense. Oops. Give a try try to give more meaningful messages when you throw these exceptions. So something like you know invalid memory bounds address. Um, you know, I actually added the bounds address that caused the exception here to the string, and then throw that. Right. So um, that should I think because that's the that was the only oops, that was the only thing that was being tested. Um, although, like I said, I probably should at least add a few more. I probably should have added. Well, let's let's try that first now finish that thought so let's see if throwing that that, that should fix this one uh, and pass the the, the test at line 50. so yeah so our first family test now is the one at 66 so we're getting past all of these assertions um on here and getting down to here so uh but yeah like i was saying i, I really do need to revisit this uh, we, we probably should have also um well I have to think about it, you know, um, but uh, we could test that you don't have like negative um, base addresses, beginning addresses that should be zero or, or bigger. So I don't know if that makes sense, but. Um... But anyway, it'd be easy to add in that too, but I don't think, I don't think anything's testing for that, so. Oops. Yeah, there it was just missing. So, so yeah, so that that's failing because uh, it's not throwing the exception there. But uh, we could add in a check for that as well. Um, It's less than zero. zero. Zero is a valid one, but not uh, anything smaller than that. So, yeah, anyway, I'm just kind of showing the. I think there's use of these aren't directly completely needed for this task, but uh, this kind of shows you some of the thought process, uh, kind of how this works there. So that uh, you know, and, and it's also an example of you know, this is. I should go back and revisit these. Uh, add in some more exhaustive unit tests here. Um, but uh, but yeah, there was an example of, of adding in kind of one of this unit tests and this test framework, and then adding the code to fix it. Kind of an example of test-driven development. So there, yeah, we're back to getting down to 67 now. So we're kind of really ready for the um, second task. Although, like I said, there, there's one or two things I still left out of the task one, but that was most of task one there. So, uh, so let me take a little breath here. Uh, so uh, questions. Let's see if, uh, if anybody wants to ask anything about stuff so far. Okay. Um, so yeah, I kind of want you. Does anybody want to ask? I mean, um, I very quickly kind of talked a little bit about some of the other tasks last time. Um, I don't know if I want to go over those again, just because I, there's one other thing I kind of want to talk about. But so there are um, seven tasks total. So there's six more after that. So I hope everybody can at least get. If, if for all these assignments in the future, I, I, I won't probably give you quite as much to get going, but. 
for the most part, if, if you if you get the assignment submitted and it compiles and runs, and if you get the first task or two completed, you, you, that, that should be more than enough to you know pass this class at least, or even get be able to get like a B, right? So because just getting just submitting something that compiles and runs, and I see that you did some work and you got the first task going is is usually enough for like a 70 on the assignment, just to let you know. So I you know the 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 task uh should get more and more difficult or try to then it's not always the case you know but um but if you take them in order you know the first one or two should be relatively easy to get things started um so the rest of these just kind of to describe these um uh, again all these are used uh ultimately by um Um, the, um, the the load memory will load uh, one of those programs from file to set up the simulation, um, and then the simulation, all, all these simulations will have um, a um, um, a function called something like run simulation. Uh, so that would be the main thing. And the run simulation basically is going to end up calling things that you implement. You know, so like the initial, well, or well, the load memory calls some of these like initialized memory, but then run simulation is going to be calling the things that you implement, like a translate address and um, uh, and, and these others, Oops. Um, and all these executes and things like that. So, so, so the the these are implementations that are hooked in by the main loop of the simulation um, for these. So. So basically, um, um, uh, when we simulate a memory like like we just did here, we have like a bank uh, a base address of um, three hundred and a bounds address of a thousand. Let's just use that as our kind of basic example. So uh, I, I, I kind of did this on purpose in this assignment um because th this this is related to an idea that we'll talk about when we get to memory management about uh the, the difference between like a virtual address um and a, a real address or um a hardware um address right so um So for example, for all of our simulations where we had the base address of 300 and bounce address of 1,000, that means that we end up allocating um, an array uh, of size 700 um, to hold the, the memory. But remember that memory, that, that the array index zero, which represents our real uh, actual hardware address, um, needs to translate to a base address of 300, right? Um, so, so, you know, uh, our, our indexes for, for memory, uh, if we allocate it for a memory size of 700, go from memory zero up to memory 699, right? Um, because we use zero-based indexing, so the 700 addresses have indexes, valid indexes from zero to 699, right? But uh, in the simulation, anytime the simulation refers to memory address 300, we want to translate that to the, the real address, the real index of zero in our simulated memory. And, and 300 and, and um, 301 should get translated to index one and so on. And um, what, 1,000, actually 999 should get translated to um, um, uh, memory address 699. Right? So, you should effectively see I mean, to implement translate address really all you have to do so so, so for translate address um let's look at the tests here too much on the screen now um translate address takes uh a virtual address as input um, and it returns the real address or the hardware address as a result right so for a memory whose virtual address space goes from 300 to 1,000, if I ask to translate 300, that should give back to an index or a real address of zero. 
if I ask to translate 476, um, that should translate to index 176 in the actual real memory array. Right? So that's all translated address. This is an example of, um, um, of, of kind of like a virtual addressing uh, scheme that we'll talk about. Uh, the difference between a virtual address space and, and where we have to translate that into um, some other um, real address space. Um, but yeah, the implementation, if we follow that, the implementation is relatively easy. All you have to do is subtract you know, the base address. So it won't always be 300. Um, you know, so if the base address is 187, um, um, you need to subtract 187 to get the, the real address or the real index. So, um, and that, you're going to be reusing the translate address for the peaks and the pokes. So this is kind of, uh, uh, if you ever, uh, or, well, probably you guys have, and this kind of goes back to when I uh, first started doing uh, computing on Apple computers and things. So they had, um, they had uh, these functions in the language, uh, the, the basic language, uh, which allowed you to actually read and write directly into memory. Uh, so, you, so you could poke values into memory wherever you wanted and peek them back out. So these work that same way, but um, what you're given for, so we can look at the test for the peek and the poke. Um, so the, you know, each one of these unit tests usually uh, corresponds to the next um, uh, task, right? So the third set of unit tests should be for the peak and the poke, I believe, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, for example, after you load the, the program 01.sim here, we expect that, um, you know, uh, again, if, if, if I open up this file, you know, we expect these values to be at address 300, 301, 302. And these values should be at 940 and 941, right? So, um, so you know, we, we, we load that program one sim, uh, and then whenever we peak the address, if we peak 300, we expect it should return back 1940. But remember, 1940 needs to be stored at address zero here. So peak address should be calling translate address to translate the virtual address into the index, then you access your memory array um, and whatever values in memory, that's what is returned by peak address, right? Um, and then the next one um, is, uh, you have a question? No. Okay. <laughs> next. Oh, <laughs> I had it till 3.30, I thought, uh, in my schedule. What, what time are you supposed to start? Three. Three? Okay. Uh, I was probably planning on stopping at three anyway, but I'll have to check that because it says 3.30 on my class schedule. I'm just a presenter for orientation. Okay. 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 No problem. We'll probably get done a little bit early today anyway. So, so this is just a one-time thing? Just to let me know? I'm not sure. Okay. So I can um, check it's for if you the one that is organizing things. Okay. Have, have them check that. Yeah. So Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, sorry about that. So, um, um, I must have skipped past it, but yeah. So there are also some um, um, tests of poke address as well. Uh, I think I, I think I scrolled past that a little bit too fast. So, so poke address, basically, you give it a virtual. Um, um, address and you give it a value and it should put that value. But again, you should be reusing translate address for your poke address, right? So th um, for memory initialized from 300 to 1000, if I poke something into 300, uh, the value 42 should end up at index zero of the memory array, right? And then, so if I poke 42 to 300, if I peek back out 300, I should get the value back. So that's what's happening on the peek and the poke here. Um, All right, and there's more I can say about fetch, execute, and load. So for, um, um, I'll just say maybe one more thing. So mostly for the, like the, these should end up being relatively like simple, one, two, three lines of code to implement all these execute, load, store, jump. So for example, to, to implement execute load, that gets called anytime a load um, 
instruction is attempted to be executed by the simulation in the execute cycle of, of our hypothetical machine here. So to execute a load, what you need to do is, um, you know, so there'll be a value in the um, accumulate, sorry, there'll be a value in the instruction register um, that has already been translated. Um, um, so let me just be concrete on this again here. This will be the last thing. There's one more thing I kind of want to show, but uh, part of executing, uh, you know, so when it fetches, it'll fetch the uh, instruction pointed to by the program counter into the um, um, into this IR opcode, and then but then part of the execute stage, it will um, translate the IR opcode. Sorry, no, that's not right. It, it'll, it'll fetch into the IR, the instruction register, and then part of the uh, execute is it will. Uh, um, break that apart. You know, so remember the first four bits or the first digit is the IR opcode. So the IR opcode will be in this um, member variable called IR opcode. And then the other 12 bits, the other three digits represent the address that the operation gets um, um, done on. So again, let's look at the load here just to make that concrete, right? So after you fetch uh, part of the execute stage, I think it's already implemented for you. Um, that might not be, you might do this in the execute, but you know, part of the execute, you have to break off the first digit. Uh, that's the opcode. So one in this case, which is a load instruction. And then the other three digits in the instruction register are the address that that um, 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 operation works on, right? So for execute load, basically, uh, you're assuming that it, that um, it's already done that. So you'll have the address in the IR address, but that's a virtual address. So to do a load, basically, you have to peak memory from whatever IR address um, is pointing to, right? So, so um, you, would, you would peak memory uh, at 940, and that should give you a three, and then whatever you peek out of memory that the IR address point to, you need to set the accumulator to be that value. That's, that's what an execute load would do, right? Uh, execute store, we kind of do the reverse, right? So execute store, you'd use the poke. If, if I was storing to 940, instead that's a two, yeah, two or to 941, um, I would take the value out of the accumulator and poke that into the IR address thing, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, all of these should be relatively simple like that, right? So execute jump, you're gonna be taking the value in the address and you're gonna be setting the program counter instead of peeking or poking it to memory for to do a jump. Add and subtract, you're gonna have to do like a peek to get the value out of memory and then subtract or add that to the accumulator to get the result and put that back in the accumulator, all right? All right, uh, does anybody kind of want to ask anything about those? Any concerns about the those tasks? Yeah. What environments are going to be used to run submitted files? Is it going to be identical to one that you presented? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, I run, when I when I do the evaluations, it runs exactly the unit tests and, and, and exactly the system tests. Um, so that's part of the evaluation of whether it's passing all those or not. The same virtual machine setup. Yes. So, and that's part of the reason why people really do need to use the dev boxes I give because I consider it incorrect if it doesn't, you know, if it's running in your environment but doesn't run in my dev box, that's your problem, you know. So, you got to be using the same compiler, the same compiler flags, and getting the same results and passing the same tests in my environment. Yeah. So, is there any way to Yes, so I mean, not on local, but so they can be accessed from any computer on the same network. Um, we can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it runs the way I gave it to you. It runs as a as a virtual machine on your local host, so you could probably set up in, in a server. I, I I could I've actually got some cloud servers if you want to. Um, I could show you how I did that. So running VS Code on like a on a machine on the cloud and just accessing it on a web browser over the internet if that's what you're looking to do. So. Uh, in the Vader file, when you specify the, the port to the IP address, you leave out the IP address, it's supposed to take that port, the science of all IP addresses. I was wondering if there is a simpler way to do that. Um, um, you know, back then, you know, setting up either an alias or another IP address so that it would link to that, so that I could come in and if there was 
Okay. Uh, yeah, shoot me an email. Um, I, I may or may not um, have um, um, a quick way to, to, to do that, but, but yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you probably can, but I, I don't know offhand what you might want to do or what, what you might be trying to do there. Um, all right, so like I was saying, let me show just one more kind of quick thing here. So, um, Um, when you do the tests, uh, when you when you're doing these these tasks, you're actually finishing up the the unit test. Oh, uh, let me open up my my finish submit my solution here. Rebuild everything here. Um, so part of the evaluation on this, um, I mean, you know, it runs these unit tests, and that's kind of what you're doing mostly when you're um, um, uh, um, doing the solutions to get all those tasks done. But there's a final thing where it runs complete simulations. So let me show you kind of how to do that by hand. So the, the ultimate goal of this, uh, like, I, like I started saying before, is uh, we, we're really trying to build a simulator so you can simulate aspects of an operating system. And, and uh, these unit tests are running basically these files by hand. So, um, and, and then comparing the output of your code to, the expected output that should be getting from running a full simulation. So um, um, these are examples. We're, we're building uh, really command line tools. So if you just do dot slash sim to run the simulation, but don't give it the parameters it's expecting, it'll give you a usage message. So, so there'll be different parameters for the different uh, simulations for assignments uh, that are expected. So for this one, if I want to run a simulation uh, from one of the files, um, you have to specify uh, the maximum cycles uh, in case um, so that we don't get into an infinite loop on anything. If there's like a jump statement with an infinite loop, it'll only run uh, like 100 fetch execute cycles. That's what the max cycles is here. Um, and, but then I can run. So the second parameter is the path to one of these dot sim files, one of these simulation files, right? So this should run the the that the 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 simulation from our textbook, right? So this is the same one as the example from you know figure one of our um, um, textbook here, figure one point four. So, right? So if you run that, you'll see you get the output um, on the terminal here. Um, and if we scroll back up to the top. What you're getting is the output from each of the fetch executions. So at, for cycle one, after the fetch, um, you know, we had, it just displays all the, con for this simulation, it displays all the contents of the registers and the contents of memory, right? So the only thing that happens after the fetch was the, the 1940 uh, should have been fetched from memory uh, 300 into the instruction register. So that's, that's what we see here. That, that was the only thing that resulted after the fetch. Uh, and then when we do the execute stage for this, it should be executing that 1940. Um, so after the execute, you know, it's, it's broken apart the instruction register. Um, you know, so the opcode is one, which is a load instruction, and, and it should be loading from 940. So the result of executing that load is we should get the value three loaded from memory um, to the accumulator. So we get the three there, right? Um, and um, so on. And you know these other pro simulation files that we have in here um, um, may or may not, of course, you, if you wanted to check your answers on the first problem set, you could uh, go ahead and create one of these simulation files with the initial problems that I gave you uh, and, and try it out to see if I have the right uh, uh, kind of answer. Although again, not, yes, we're not really handling the uh, hexadecimal like you had to do on the uh, on the problem set, uh, you wouldn't be able to do it exactly all of those unless we added in um, hexadecimal translation for these. So, um, um, and it's kind of one kind of a quick thing. So the way that the the um, uh, 
what are called the system test work is basically we capture the output from running a simulation on the command line. Um, and we just do a diff. Okay. So um, in um, the sim files directory for every um, sim input, there's a, a result, which is the expected correct output, right? So when we run a full simulation, we do the equivalent like this to, to do the system test for you, just, just so you guys know how these are working. Uh, you won't have to do much with this on this first assignment, but later on, you, you might, you'll have to do extra things to get the system test to work, even after you get the unit tests working. So, um, so, so in this case, system tests, all we're doing is a, a, a diff between what your simulation is giving and the um, and the expected result for a correct full simulation there. So. So yeah, the diff tool, again, you know, if you have no little bit of, you can, basically if the files have no differences, you get no output. But if there's if there's a, a difference, um, so so if you're not doing everything correct, so if my first fetch, I ended up with uh, 941 unexpectedly for some reason, the instruction register, um, it would detect that something's wrong in, in your full simulation. So. Um, and yes, yeah, so, so I did mention this also for, as a final thing. To actually submit the things for grading for this class, you have to do a make submit. All this is doing is creating a file for this assignment called assignment one tar.gz. That needs to be uploaded um, to our my Leo online for the assignment one. Okay. Uh, but you really do need to use the make submit command uh, because again, you know, um, I mean. You could do this by hand, but I am expecting exactly these files so that when I extract it, rerun the tests, the unit tests and the system tests, uh, everything is there that I'm expecting of the work that you did. So I can uh, see whether it's running, compiling and passing the tests and things like that. So. All right. Um, yeah, so questions, that, that was kind of all the stuff I wanted to cover, I, I was thinking about here. See, any questions online either? Um, I'll stick around for a bit longer here in case you want to ask some things one on one. But uh, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, call that a day for today. Then so I'll let you guys go. Now we'll see you next week. You know, if you have questions, email me after we adjourn as well for the people online. Yeah, I need to, to stop this session here so I can get this posted here. So all right. That's it. I'll see you guys later then. Let's go ahead and stop this.